I'll turn to Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15 tonight, and I hope that uh, you do yearn for God as the heart pants, as the deer pants after the water brooks. Um, while I'm thinking of it, in a few weeks we're going to be having a uh, Sunday, special Sunday, the third Sunday of August, August the 21st, we're calling it Morning of Worship, and just talking about how often we worship God, not just in the good times, but in the challenging times, and some special things planned. We're going to have a Q&A panel with some of our folks who've processed grief and uh, chronic illnesses and things of that nature. Um, and we're going to be studying uh, Psalm 42 and talking about some of the ideas of yearning for God and letting Him renew us and refresh us. So looking forward to that in just a few weeks on August the 21st. Romans 15 tonight, uh, just this word of preview. Next week we're going to dig into the very... Uh, the very easy book of Galatians, a very light reading. Uh, here I'm being somewhat facetious. We're going to work through the book of Galatians the rest of this year on Sunday nights, and we'll start that next week in Galatians chapter 1. So if you've got Galatians all figured out and you want to teach on it, let me know, and uh, we will uh, go on that journey together in some way. But uh, looking forward to starting that next week. And it kind of dovetails on what we're talking about here, where we do have things that are non-essentials, Galatians deals with the essentials of the gospel and how to navigate that. Uh, so looking forward to starting that next week uh, in our evening service. Romans 15, let's begin in verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to, ple- <coughs> excuse me, to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For if Christ please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we may through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another according to Christ Jesus. That's a key phrase. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 7, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so we talked about in the previous two weeks of our mini-series here, looking at the art of deference, dealing with non-essentials, matters of conscience, and between us as believers who see things differently, we talked about things we shouldn't have. The first being we should not be judgmental. That's the first half of chapter 14 of of, uh, Romans. And then last time, a few weeks ago, we talked about the idea of not... Um, being deferential is something we do without hindering. So without judging and without hindering. Those are the negatives. And so tonight we want to talk about how to have deference with imitation, being like Christ as we navigate differences uh, in our walk with other believers. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you for the privileges to be here again tonight. Thank you for these dear folks. They're desire for your word and its application in their lives. I pray that what we um, are about to do would not be merely an exercise of duty and um, drudgery, but Lord, it would be a delight as we seek to let your word be open to us and then to allow it to open us up and to examine us and to change us. Uh, We do thank you for (laughs) the Fielder family and what they're doing to get your word into the heart language of other people groups around the globe. And to help us, Lord, to not take it uh, for granted the privilege we have to open your word tonight and to read it uh, in our own language and to be able to process it and to personalize it. Uh, help us to buy up this opportunity tonight. Pray for each that's here, those that regularly frequent and are faithful here, as well as guests, that you would just encourage us, Lord, to be less divisive when we can, and Lord, to do so by simply imitating your Son and how he navigated the differences of those around him in his earthly ministry. Bless now the study, be honored in it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I saw today in the news, just this uh, tonight, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a gentleman named Bill Russell or not, 11-time NBA champion, just passed away this afternoon uh, or earlier today, and uh, just brought back some memories of him and other heroes that I've had. Bill Russell would precede me a bit as far as his playing days, um, I'm of the generation of the Be Like Mike. That, that's me. And I remember growing up having Michael Jordan posters on my bedroom walls. Uh, I would drive to the hoop with my tongue hanging out. 
Uh, I would wear an armband in the same exact location on my left forearm that has always been massive, yeah, right? Uh, I had that, that armband that I would wipe my forehead, you know, after sweating so profusely playing basketball. I had one problem, though. I'm white, okay? And uh, in fact, I never was able, uh, I would claim at least my excuse in high school would be I couldn't palm the ball as well as Michael Jordan. It was just, you know, an anatomical thing. I didn't have the size hands of Michael Jordan. Otherwise, I would have been a tremendous dunker. Um, and so I wanted to be like him, and yet it always, I always would have that in my mind, and then as I would drive to the lane into the rim and then not quite get to the rim, I'm not quite where he's at. Can I say tonight as it relates to deference, the reason we're not good at it, this art of deference, of deferring to another, and as we've defined it each week, um, it simply means humble submission and a respect for others. The reason we're not real good at it is because the standard of deference is less than what God has given us. Um, we tend to defer to others in the same way that we saw in our formative years, either our parents, how they would navigate issues of conscience between them and other believers, either for the good or the bad or the indifferent, uh, or it's just what's the average Christian response to differences between us. And I just want to challenge you tonight. We talked about some of the negatives. Tonight, let's, for a moment, before we finish this little study we're sharing together, let's reestablish and reaffirm the standard, which is Jesus Christ. He is the goal, right? He is the gold standard uh, of any attribute that God requires in his people, whether that be another character trait or this skill uh, of deference as we are studying. And so don't allow family, your formative years, other believers... Uh, to lower the bar uh, of where God has established it in the person of Jesus Christ. So again, just by way of review tonight, in the first half of Romans 14, Paul says that we're not to despise or to judge others on these kind of secondary issues. In verses 13 to 23, we're not to hinder them. Uh, so we have to be very careful not to do those two negative things. Now he introduces a third principle in this area of deference, which is to be like Christ. I was reading an article the other day that I think kind of sets the table for our study this evening. Listen to these words. This is so um, counter how we think as American or Western believers. The author said this, church division is a privilege. Let me explain. When the church in America has the ability to fight and split over secondary issues and preferences, it reveals how spoiled, how rich, and how privileged we really are. Churches in other parts of the world don't have that privilege. Maybe it's more of a curse for us because they are in the minority, under, under-resourced, and are sometimes even persecuted. So they lay down their secondary issues and preferences to rally around the core essentials of the faith and to band together as the family of God. Listen, in this community, in Wayne County, let alone zoom out within, I mean, thousands of miles of where we sit tonight, we got options. And sometimes because we've got options, we are very underdeveloped about, you know what? We got to figure this out. And so may I encourage you, don't let yourself off the hook or someone else where a conversation or some deference needs to be expressed uh, between you. So the question tonight is this, in a day that navigates differences in a very subjective and fickle manner, how do we in contrast develop a Christ-mimicking tone and disposition toward uh, the areas that we differ with others? All right, let's talk about three areas that we can get better at imitating Jesus Christ. Number one, let's talk for a minute, first of all, about imitating, imitating him in what we draw pleasure from, imitation in pleasure. What do we derive pleasure from? from. Um, Somebody was talking about media, and whether that be social media or traditional media, the news, etc., the author said (laughs) said this, media is a factory that mass produces hard hearts and thin skin. We become easier to offend than to please. And then in contrast, he said this, a healthy church is a greenhouse that breeds soft hearts and thick skin. We become easier to please than to offend. And so I'd like you to think about tonight, how hard is it for other believers to please you? And how hard are you working to please them? Or have we become so desensitized that our hot takes and our angles on things are, we're going to say them and share them no matter how it affects uh, those around us. And so we need to imitate Jesus 
uh, in this area of what brings us pleasure and how we strive to please others in the right sense. All right, let me give you a couple of sub points there in your outline in the bulletin, not on the slides. Number one, please others to be selfless like Christ. And let's look at verse one and three that speak to this aspect of, or this agenda of imitating Christ in who and how we are pleasing. Verse one, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Notice this last phrase, and to not, and not to please ourselves. So Paul here in verse 1, he's talking to the strong. Who are the strong? Those who feel greater liberty on these meat kind of issues or these holiday kind of issues, these holy days. And he says, though you may have liberty, uh, may we be willing to not please ourselves. Instead, may we strive to please others. The tendency if we are stronger in the faith and that we recognize some of these issues are at least secondary issues when others have a strong sense of conscience on them is we assert our right to experience and to have that liberty often in a way that discourages the other believer. Since when is anything, including even right things that we do about just pleasing ourselves? Uh, we live in a day, we have options about everything, don't we? Well, I don't like that. I prefer this. We've gotten so used to and so petty about things and preferential about things that we're unaccustomed to giving up our rights and giving up even our privileges in Jesus Christ in these areas of liberty. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, and I think as it relates to pleasing God, we must let go of pleasing ourselves. All right, go to verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, even Christ. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And so Paul now puts forth the sterling example, example, the prime example of Jesus Christ of how it is to live in a way that is selfless and is striving to please others uh, around him. Did not Jesus Christ have every right to stay in heaven? He didn't have to come help us. He didn't have to lay aside. Philippians 2 talks about the kenosis. He emptied himself of the rights and privileges of being God. He still was God. But he laid that aside for us. Did he have to? No. And for some reason, between that and where we are now in this generation of Christianity, we've lost the heart and the desire and the commitment to let go of self. In fact, he quotes here from Psalm 69, Psalm 69 in verse 9, the reproaches, reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. What we deserve, Christ shouldered. He did that for us. He did that at his own expense. And so this is the standard by which we are to please those around us. Um, this may be a bit blunt tonight or convicting. It is for me at least. I think one of the reasons we're so self-absorbed with our liberties is that we think when we give up our liberty, it's a bigger sacrifice than it actually is. Like, is it really a big deal to just keep your mouth shut and me keep my mouth shut when someone else says something that I may not fully agree with or see the same way they do? Again, not on major doctrines, but on these secondary issues. It's not as big a deal. It's not as big a sacrifice. May we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Compare the suffering of Jesus on the cross to you not eating meat kind of issues. And that's where we begin to see the proper perspective on the little bit we need to sacrifice to practice this art of deference. came across this the other day. An author was talking about the church, and we really work at this in our church. I say this regularly. There are things about our church I don't like. There are things about this church I would not prefer. Since when is the church about our preferences, right? The community, we don't pull the community for what they think we should do or be. And again, trying to be relevant and speak to the issues as we're doing even on Sunday mornings right now. But it's not about what the world prefers. It's not about what the membership prefers. It's not about what I prefer. Um, and, and I think in the church sometimes we just get so used to our preferences being catered to. And this author, I think, points this out. He says, if you commercialize the church, members become consumers and the gospel becomes a commodity that they will demand to be customized to their preferences. And then he said this, may we be faint, in contrast, may we be found faithful to Christ and to his call. And to Christ and his call has nothing to do with our preferences. Uh, so we need to be very careful in that and how we interact with uh, the brethren. 
I have just found this, and Jesus did this for the Father, tends to be what I want and what the Father wants are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Jesus pleased the Father. He pleased the Father, not himself. And so may we follow in his footsteps. All right. Number two, or secondly, capital B there, please others to be selfless like Christ. Number two, be please others to be edifying like Christ. Go back to verse two. Paul says this, let every one of us please his neighbor, and then notice this qualifier at the end of verse 2, for his good to, what's the last word? Edification. Please others to be edifying like Christ. You know that it's possible to disagree with someone without destroying that person? Um. The, those that I respect the most and actually have convinced me to maybe shift on things or change my mindset on things are those who disagree with me, and yet they're still somehow building me up. They've learned how to disagree and still edify. And often that's a spirit and a tone and a wisdom that takes years and years to develop. Uh, and so may we always be pleasing others with the agenda of edifying. The tendency is I disagree with you, now I'm going to tear you down. We're not just tearing down their opinion or their position, we're tearing them down. And so here Paul says in verse 2, just to be careful, we're not trying to just please everybody for the sake of pleasing them. We're pleasing them so that we can encourage them and edify them and grow them in their faith. Go back to chapter 14 in verse 19 very quickly. He says in verse 19 of chapter 14, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, notice this, and things wherewith one may edify another. Um, and so deference is a, is a key component of being an edifying believer. If I were to say to you, who is stronger in their faith and closer to Jesus Christ today, tonight, because of your influence, if you don't have anyone or that list is shorter than you know it should be, it could be this is a skill you haven't developed fully. Because you and me, if we're not careful, we only want to be around and we only want to help people who agree with us or are willing to change to agree with us. Uh, You're limiting your sphere of influence uh, if you'll only edify those who completely agree with you. All right, go to verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, we who have all of our differences, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And so we see here the Psalms, this quotation again from the book of Psalms reminds us that the Old Testament scriptures were written for our learning. In them are lessons, invaluable lessons for us to learn that as we encounter problems and tribulations and trials that the scriptures teach us to be steadfast. They give to us, notice, comfort. They give to us great hope. Um, My father-in-law has drawn some diagrams on this, Moses and others I've read. One of the things I'm struck by with creation, I guess since we were studying this morning, is the overlap of the early generations. You know, they're living 800, 900 years who were contemporaries of each other. And, and one made this conclusion, I don't know if you've thought of this, but Noah died only two years before Abraham was born. Like, just let that give your brain some whiplash tonight. So, so Noah died only two years before Abraham was born. That's how close they were to living on the planet at the same time. And then he said this, and for 85% of his life, Abraham could have grabbed breakfast with Shem, an eyewitness of the flood. Like that's unbelievable. I don't know if they grabbed breakfast in the sense we would mean that today, but there was such overlap. Can I just tell you the hope of the early believers in these early accounts in Genesis, they were not doing it alone. Like we tend to read Abraham and then we read about this guy, you know, Isaac and Jacob. We segment them in ways that was not even close to how they lived. Yeah, they were intense and they were nomads, but they interacted with each other. And often their interaction is what stirred and kept and sustained their hope in God. And I guarantee there were deference There was deference given between them. I mean, they're living in a whole different generations of human history. Imagine interacting with someone not just from 50 years ago. Oh, I'm more traditional. You're more contemporary. Oh, yeah? Well, I lived 800 years ago, okay? It just, we get so stuck on an era. And what's striking to me is the Old Testament spans such a lengthy period of time, and they figured out how to get along with with all of those differences in time and space and experiences 
Uh, and so that is what sustained them. That's what undergirded their hope and comfort in the Word of God. Um, if tonight we cannot bear up under the infirmities of the week that are referenced back in verse 1, it could be that we're not drawing our strength as much from the Word of God as we claim we are. Um, man, I just can't be around a weak brother. It drives me crazy. Well, where is your strength? Where is your hope? Where is your comfort? If it's in the Word of God, we can bear up under the burdens and infirmities of the weak. Any motive less than edifying others will tend to be about pleasing others. So if we're not trying to edify them, the best case scenario is we're trying to please them. But here's the, here's the kicker. We're only doing so ultimately to please ourselves. They like me. They accept me. They, they want to be around me instead of doing it in a way that pleases and honors the Lord. Last thought, we'll move to our second point tonight. Somebody said this, the best parts of us, so whatever you can think of in your life, this is a quality that God has blessed me with and done something in my life. The best parts about us are reflections of the people who have loved us selflessly. The best parts of us are the result of those who have loved us selflessly. Are we giving that to the brethren, even with differences, are we imitating the selflessness of pleasing others like Christ? All right, go to verse 5. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. All right, number two, let's talk for a minute about reception. So imitation in pleasing the brethren. Number two, imitation in receiving the brethren. <laughs> it was interesting, one of the things that we in London a few months ago when we were there as we went to um, what are called the war rooms. And it is where Churchill managed World War II from under uh, Downing Street and really neat exhibits that are there. And there was this quote uh, on, you can kind of see in the background some of the museum, but there was a quote painted on the wall of this mural. Churchill was once quoted as saying this, there's only one thing worse than fighting with allies and that's fighting without them. So allies are their own mixed bag, right? But what's worse than having allies is not having allies. Can I just ask you a question tonight? I don't know if you've thought about this lately. As much as we drive each other crazy, let's be honest, it happens, right? Our families, our church, whatever. I'm not saying I, you don't drive me crazy, but I'm sure I drive you crazy. Um, can you really imagine doing this alone all by yourself? Yeah, maybe on a good day, maybe. But not, not on an average day and definitely not on a low ebb day. We need each other. And if we need each other, then we need to get good. We need to get better at receiving one another. Um, because at some point, it's going to be us who needs the reception. And so we see Jesus modeling for us the spirit of reception, being open to those uh, around us. Um, the, uh, the other thing that was interesting with Churchill they said the only thing that he and Hitler had in common was they hated whistling. Um, in fact, in the war rooms on several walls, they had painted, no whistling, no whistling, no whistling. Uh, Churchill had typewriters where they took out all of the things that made noise in them. They were quiet ones. They spent like 20 times as much for these typewriters. Just those, those incessant noises drove him crazy. I can relate, okay, uh, with my issues. Um, but, but that was the only thing they had in common is people, their noises drove those two pivotal leaders in World War II crazy. And, and so may we not run from those who annoy us, may we actually run toward them. That's God's solution uh, as it relates to those that we disagree with. All right, let me give you a couple things quickly as it relates to that. Number one, receive others to be aligning, aligning like Christ. In verse 5 that we just read, we see this, this like-mindedness that God aligns us as we receive one another. Um, the reference to the God of patience and consolation that begins verse 5 indicates that behind this patience and comfort that the scriptures give is a God who offers them. Um, part of our issue with deference is we're only relying upon our resources to be deferential. Man, I am in a mood today, or this person, and their personality and mine, just great. And I'm not thinking of any of you as I say that, okay? Um, but the tendency is to focus only on what I can bring to bear. And when I get to that point, I'm just done. 
What about the God of all comfort and consolation and patience, who nothing is impossible to this God, who can help you get along and me get along with anyone? I think we sell our, ourselves short. We dismiss people. We, we push away from those that God has put in our life providentially that he's more than able to help us have a healthy relationship with. And then the end of verse 5, he says that you be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. And so it is through Christ that we are able to get along. It's through Christ that we're able to minister and to receive one another. Can you imagine how much of Jesus' earthly ministry stuff had to bother him if he would have let it? Um, I don't think we can even begin to comprehend the, the, the condescension of Jesus Christ and just the filth and the, the not just physically and tangibly germ-wise, but just, just the contamination of the fall and the curse and he who left the ivory palaces and yet he came near to people and he received them to the table and he received them into his company. He embraced them, he touched them, he interacted with them. That's the standard of our deference. And so we align with each other as we follow the example of Jesus Christ. With the God of the Bible as our enabler, we have no, listen, we have no legitimate excuse to be misaligned with our brethren. Now, if they make a move that compromises that unity, that's one thing. But I'm talking about just normal day-to-day grind and interaction with other believers, with the God of all patience and consolation at our disposal, uh, we should be able to get along with those to whom we differ. And you notice here in the text, I don't know if you noticed this, I said this back in chapter 14, Paul does not deal with the actual issues. He never, he alludes to which side of the issue he lands on, but he in no way here in chapter 15 emphasized, so don't eat meat observe this holiday, this holy day every year. His primary concern is the unity of the brethren, which leads to the glory of God and all the things that will follow. And so the emphasis is upon unity, aligning with Christ through the art of deference. All right, verse six, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. So this is the, the motive, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, receive others to be glorifying like Christ, to be aligning like Christ. Number two, to be glorifying like Christ. Um, I was reading a little book on the Christian conscience. I think I mentioned it, one of the books I've been reading in recent days, and he was talking about how to deal with I don't know about you, I tend to not give the benefit of the doubt to someone who draws the line differently than me. Do you, any of you relate to that? Like I have a conviction on something or I feel great liberty in a certain area. Whatever the other person's position is, I tend to question their motives if I'm not careful or even their position itself. And this author said this in reference to that. I love this. He said, welcome those who disagree with you on food and drink and holy days. So those would be the examples as we're reading learn about them. And then I love this. Appreciate their robust conscience was the one side of the issue. The other, he said, is assume that they are exercising their freedoms for God's glory. Like, can we at least give each other the benefit of the doubt? I love the Lord. Don't you love the Lord? And if we both love the Lord, then at least wherever you draw the line, I think your motive may be right. And and assuming that instead of assuming the ulterior option, which is I'm right, you're wrong, and you have an agenda that's less than noble. Uh, And so receive others in a way that brings glory to God. Assume that they're trying to glorify God just as you are. And so in verse 6, you notice the purpose of this harmony that he references back in verse 5 is so that with one mind and one voice, we may glorify God together. Who is that? The God and Father of Jesus Christ. You know the lid on this, this ministry, our church, and even our individual families where we have other believers that we have relationship, you know what the lid is of our potential? It's our ability to get along. It's our ability to give each other a little room and grace and understanding to grow and change and be all that God wants us to be. That will either limit or that will expand our potential for the glory of God. Warren Wearsby in this section said this, local churches have the right to establish standards but not beyond what the Word teaches. 
We must lovingly allow for, allow for differences among Christians and not use these differences as opportunities for division. That's well put. And what I see in churches in our day is we're setting up standards uh, in our ministry or in our church that are not in the Word of God. And we're undercutting our potential for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can do whatever you want in your own space, and so can I. We'll all answer to God for that. But sometimes we just can't handle seeing things a little differently, and we limit the ability to bring praise and glory to the God that has called us. And so be open to that where God brings application. Um, tribalism has no place. We're going to all spend eternity together, right? Like where are those who disagree with you on some of these? Where do you think they're going to be forever in eternity? Some lesser heaven, a little further from the throne than Mr. Arrived You or Miss You? Uh, it, it, we, we forget that. And so be very careful with that and how you process these differences uh, in whatever manner. By the way, in heaven... I don't think heaven's worship will be like any of our preferred worship, probably, okay? Whether you feel like it's a little left or right or center, it's going to be a thing we've never experienced before, and I love that, don't you? It's going to be amazing, the international flavor. There may be a few more bongo drums than we would prefer, I don't know, or it's a little too chill for us, I, I don't know, but it's going to be what God wants, and the diversity and the deference that will be freely offered in that place. All right, go to verse 7. For some of you now, think about the bongo drums. Verse 7, I, don't, I do not know where that came from. I don't even know if I know what a bongo, I think I know what a bongo, do you know what a bongo drum sounds like? I think I do. Okay, verse 7. Some of you bongo drum junkies. All right, verse 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us. Wow, this is a tough verse. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us. Here it is again. To the glory of God. So in this concluding verse of this section, notice the stronger and the weaker Christian are urged to receive each other, not like every other Christian, but like Christ has received us. Um, Paul's point here is that if the Lord can receive us, think about the chasm between where he is and where we were and where we still are. And if he can close that gap and still receive us, the least we can do is receive others uh, to which we have minor differences uh, between us. And so that's the standard of how we receive each other. And as we do that, it brings glory and honor to God. Now go back to verse 1 of chapter 14, because there's almost, we're going to spend a few moments in the last few verses of our text tonight in a moment. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 14, and we find the same little word. So there's kind of this, this passage that begins with this idea of reception and it ends with it. Back in verse 1, him that is weak in the faith, what's the next word? receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. And so we see this idea of reception comes now full circle where, listen, we can receive because Christ has received us. And so he is the standard. He is the point of reference we use to determine whether we are receiving the way God would have us to. It matters how you treat those with whom you disagree. Because if you'll welcome them and you'll receive them like Christ did, it's God's glory that's at stake. You know what I think gets the attention of the world it has since the dawn of the church is the fact that people with so many differences can get together around the word of God, and then they can go after the world with the gospel. It's not just our message and God's love. It's the fact, how in the world do you guys get along? How do you come together? And it is our diversity that is not our enemy. It's not what weakens the cause of Christ. It's actually an asset when this art of deference is in play uh, with God's help. And so if God is to receive all the glory from our lives and our ministries that he, our ministry that he deserves, we must fully receive our brothers and sisters in Christ. And don't do the token reception. Receive. Receive. Let them into your personal space. Let them into your home. Let them into your heart and life. And as we do so, God is glorified. All right, one more picture, because I think this captures them. We'll get to our last point. Um, you see this top statement, and, I, and I'm not discounting people that mistreat us and abuse us. That's not the spirit of this. But some would say, don't cross oceans for people who wouldn't cross a puddle for you, and something to that effect. And uh, the author I was reading said there's no do it. Cross the ocean for people, love people, all people, no conditions attached, no wondering whether they're worthy or not. Cross oceans, climb mountains, love, life and love isn't what you gain, uh, isn't about what you gain, it's about what you give. If we are only going to offer love to those who agree with us and that we like, that's what the publicans do, Christ said. 
Matthew chapter 5, check it. The reign of God falls on the just and the unjust alike. What gets the world's attention, what gets God's glory, is when we love those who others are not willing to love. And so that affects our relationship with the world, and obviously it applies in this area we're talking about tonight with other believers. All right, number three, and lastly, let's go to verse eight and talk about imitation of Christ in our service. Verse number eight. All right, we read only through verse 7. Let's work down to verse 13 as we finish with a few thoughts as we finish. Verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Imitation in service. Um, The other day a friend of mine sent a video he saw of a dog who was in the back of a, looked like a little SUV, uh, SUV that had like a windshield wiper on the back, you know, that had the more vertical windsh- or, uh, rear view, rear window. And uh, the wiper was going, and then the dog, every time the wiper would move, the dog would like, like growl at it, like he's in the back window, just like, Rawr! you know, like it's the enemy. And then it would stop for a second, dog would calm down, and then the wiper would go again, Rawr! and he would like, just, and it was just hilarious watching this dog just go spastic after this windshield wiper. You know, for a lot of us, I think if we're honest, the reason we're missing the ministry God has for us is because we're so busy focused on the thing that's bothering us, the person, the circumstances, that we're not seeing the ministry that God has for us in this season of life. We're barking and growling at everything that moves, and especially everything that moves that's different uh, from us. And so Paul here talks for just a minute as he finishes this section about the two primary objectives of Christ's ministry that also should be the mission and uh, primary objectives of our ministry uh, for the Lord. So let's talk about those two as we finish. Number one, serve others to be affirming like Christ, to be affirming. So Jesus' first purpose, as we read in verse number 9, or verse 8, was to confirm the promises made to the forefathers of the Israelites, the patriarchs. He was coming to affirm that what God had promised, he had delivered on. And in verse 8, Paul begins to emphasize that the Jews are included in God had delivered on those promises, and God's word was truthful. He was the minister of the circumcision. He served those who were Jews. Um, And so we see that inclusion there in verse number 8. Verse 13, Now that God, we'll come back to the verses between in a moment. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you might abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so again, this affirming, as you guys become more unified, you'll be more confident in the promises of God and what he has said he will deliver he will deliver on Um, just let's pause for just a second like you to think about this category of person what about the person that we don't offer deference to when we should and we don't what does that cause them to question So we claim to represent God, believe in God, and we're like Mr. or Mrs. faithful to the Word of God, and we're not willing to offer reception, deference, the things we've been talking about tonight to them. You know that affects not just their view of you, but often their view of God? That now they feel excluded not just by you, but by God? That they begin to doubt His promises, they begin to doubt that He can deliver on, and that they matter, and that they're a part of Uh, of the people of God, again, through the normal standards and requirements that God gives in his word. And so our withholding fellowship often causes others to think, not only don't they like me, God doesn't like me. Uh, So we have to be very careful how we convey that vibe uh, to those around us. Listen, and back to us now, insecure people are critical people. And those who are secure in God and Christ and in his calling and his purpose and mission for their life, they don't have time to criticize other people. They've got too much to do. They've got too much that God has compelled them to do and to be. And so our insecurity in God's promises often translates to criticizing the brethren. Secure people are affirming to others, which are you, which am I. All right, then quickly go back to verse 9. So he talks about the Jews, and now he pivots to the second category in the early church. That would be the Gentiles, verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. 
And now he quotes from four Old Testament passages, and I'll just read through them. We don't have time to study them at length tonight. As it is written, so this isn't all from one text, it's chosen from several. For this cause I will confess to thee, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all ye Gentiles, and laud him all ye people. And again, Isaiah, or Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. All right, lastly, jot this down. So why do we need to imitate Christ with our service? First, to affirm like Christ. Number two, serve others to be including. To be including like Christ. Um, Have you noticed that the IRS wants to include all of your income as taxable? Have any of you noticed that? We just had tax season recently. We're still waiting on our return. I don't know if you are or not, if you have a return coming. The, the expedited operations of our federal government. They want my taxes, you know, turned in by date, but then there's kind of a winter mine coming back, okay? That, that's where we're at. But this, someone said this to me tongue-in-cheek. According to unofficial sources, this is not true, okay, but just kind of poking. A new uh, simplified income tax form contains only four lines. All right, here they are, so you're not going to need a tax guy anymore. First question, what was your income for the year? Number two, second question, what were your expenses? Question number three, how much do you have left? And then number four, send it in. <laughs> that, that's, that's the simplified tax form. If you, does that resonate with any of you? Um, it, it's inclusive. Um, can I say to you as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ, why don't more people feel included? If this message is for the whole world, it's to be preached to every creature, and yet it's falling on so many deaf ears, what has changed? Why isn't it as vibrant and dynamic and effective as it once was in early days of church history? There are a lot of factors, but the lost are just as blind and ignorant as they've ever been, and the gospel is just as efficacious and powerful as it's ever been. Maybe it's God's people that have changed, and we're not including in ways that we should. And so we see Christ including not just the Jews here, but also uh, the Gentiles. And so we see his second purpose is to extend these previously covenant promises from God to the Jews to the world at large. Uh, He quotes from David in Romans uh, 15 and verse 9. He talks of David, and then Moses is quoted. Uh, And then you see uh, the psalmist again in verse 11 quoted, and then in verse The last verse we read, Isaiah, is predicting the Gentiles will live under the rule of the root of Jesse. Who is that? The Messiah. And they will hope in him. They will have relationship uh, with him. And so this mission, this purpose, our deference allows others to be included uh, into what God wants to do in their hearts. Um, One author said this, we won't be distracted by comparison if we are captivated by purpose. Our purpose is to get the gospel to every creature, right? Right? It's not for us to agree on everything. In these matters of conscience, these Romans 14 and 15 kind of issues, we have a greater purpose and mission than convincing everybody of our take on those given things. The reason our deference wanes over time, with especially those that are different than us, that we'd prefer to exclude from us, is because we lack or we leak divine purpose. It was neat today. We had a lot of visitors in our service this morning. I hope you got to meet them. And the refrain I got from several of them, and then a few of you I talked with as well, is how friendly our church is, Um, that we actually want new people to come here. We're not threatened by it. We're not, hey, you're in my seat, that kind of a vibe. I I honestly, I'm not kidding when I say this. I've thought about just moving the chairs every month or two, so you just can't have that. That's not a bad thing, right? Like, giving room for new people to onboard. We have some folks uh, here tonight as well that are newer and Um, Just being welcoming. Do you know that's a bigger deal than I think we often realize? Because we're not just including them into us. We're allowing them, if God works in their heart and they respond, to be included into his eternal plan, his redemptive plan. It's bigger uh, than just us. And so this skill of deference is a big deal. Uh, Heidi and I, yesterday, we had outreach, salt outreach, and had some great visits. Met a young family, didn't come today, but they're seeking a church. I'm praying for them as well. But we had a lady sitting with my wife. I don't know if you got to meet her or not. And uh, went to her door, and Heidi talked to her, and um, just Friday night, so we're there Saturday morning. Friday night, she had decided she's going to try to find a church. Her friend had been counseling her. 
So she's going to find a church where God can help her. And then instead, God found her, which was really cool yesterday. So we talked with her, and then she was in church today. And then Heidi and I met with her after church. Little caveat, I forgot to tell the deacons I was having a meeting. So when I walked out, I set off the alarm. That was fun uh, in our, our security system because we were here till maybe 1.30, 1.45, something like that, meeting with her, Heidi and I. But just sharing with her, first hearing what she's working through and then sharing with her the gospel. She didn't get saved today, but we planted seed and gave her some things to read. And hopefully she's going to get involved in our groups. I think she would thrive in that environment. So if you ladies see her on Sunday, that's her. But I was just thinking about this idea of inclusion. Like if we don't get better at getting along with each other where we have minor differences, how in the world are we going to be gracious and deferential toward those that have major doctrinal issues? that we do need to deal with, but we need to do it artfully. We need to do it with the Spirit leading us. And so here's the thought. Us dealing with our differences helps us get better at reaching the world that has some very stark differences. Uh, And so if we can't do it here, uh, we're not going to be able to do it uh, there. And so it's important that we develop this skill. It helps this church reach all nations with the gospel. Because then we can reach anyone ever, anywhere if we've learned how to navigate uh, these differences. All right, let me give you a final thought and then give you a, a diagram I think will help bring this to application. An author said this, a church, listen, this is great. A church is a cross-cultural laboratory, laboratory for effective mission. If a church is unhealthy in its own culture, then the last thing another country needs in the world is for that church to reproduce itself in that, in that other country. The problems will only multiply. Paul calibrated his own conscience for love and mission. He unselfishly gave up some of his own freedoms in order to to love and fellowship with other Christians and to spread the gospel to the nations. And then he asked this question, can you imagine how edifying a church would be, both locally and globally, if it were filled with members who calibrated their conscience like Paul? Where could we go? Who could we impact if we got beyond the pettiness? What could God do with North Life Baptist Church? All right, I want to show you this last chart. This is really good, and it's going to probably overwhelm you a bit, but this is a summary of these three weeks we spent together. So this would be the meat issues, um, the holiday or holy day issues. So you have the extreme to the left of the strong conscience. Remember, we dealt with some of that. See at the bottom, the heresy that you can creep into, the arrogance that you can have, or the judginess. Um, And then you see the other end of the spectrum, the weak conscience, um, the judgmentalism, the heresy as well. It it works both ways. And then you see in the middle the solution of loving the brethren. Um, So you have the one with the strong conscience. If you can see within those bars, one, two, and three, and working from left to right, one would be the strong conscience, fully persuaded yet welcoming, uh, rather than looking down on those with a weak conscience and he chooses to eat meat. Um, He thinks, I have freedom to eat meat for the glory of God, but I still welcome Christians who disagree. So he does it, or she does it, but does it with love. Uh, And this reveals the gospel. On the other side, column three, uh, you have the weak conscience, fully persuaded yet welcoming rather than judging those with a strong conscience, and opts not to eat meat. The thinking behind that, quote, I abstain from eating meat for the glory of God, but I still welcome Christians who disagree. And so that love also reveals the gospel. Now here's the goal in the very middle there. Um, The strong conscience, but free to be flexible in disputable matters in order to edify fellow believers and, number two, to advance the gospel. So flexible. And the thinking would be, I've become all things to all people that I might all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9.22 that is the love that ultimately I think is the goal in Christ-like, and does, what does that do? It magnifies the gospel. So there's a lot on that chart. If you'd like it, I can send it to you. But that is the spirit in, of the text. And I'm telling you, without Jesus as the standard, we will not live in, in that center column. We will always lean one way or the other, and we not only do something that's maybe extreme, but we also pass judgment. And the hardest part is the guy in the last column and the guy in the other column on the other end of the chart. And that's what I see pulling us apart when Christ is trying to bring us together and say, listen, guys, these are not the issues. 
Let it go. Be flexible. Be gracious. Be deferential toward uh, one another. And so the Christian freedom we're talking about tonight is not I always do what I want or I always do what pleases the other person. It is I do what brings glory to God. I do what brings others under the influence of the gospel. I do what promotes the peace of the local church. All right, this last statement. This is, I, I don't know if you thought of this. The Apostle Paul, so the one who wrote these words, what happened when he got to heaven? Starting with a guy named Stephen. The Apostle Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he martyred. That, brethren, that's how the gospel works. And I'm telling you, the moment we enter there, even big things like this will not matter. In fact, they will only bring redounding glory to God that we can now gather. Stephen, can you imagine the look? I don't know what the look was or the hug that followed, but I'm telling you, God got glory when those two guys together now, for several years to say the least, are worshiping Jesus Christ. It's about him. May we allow that to color and to affect us in the here and now. So here's the question and we'll finish. We allow God to help you skillfully develop your ability of deference through imitating what Christ did in pleasure, in reception, and in service. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word.